Welcome back. If you missed Flashpoint last Sunday morning, maybe it was because you forgot to set your clocks ahead. Or maybe you did, but you were just a little too tired to get up. Maybe you felt a little off for several days this week. It happens every spring when we lose that hour. And many of us wonder how this anachronism has stuck around for so long. Why do we still move this hour around twice a year? In fact, several senators last week suggested it's time to ditch the fallback spring forward dance. Let's talk about it with one of the world's foremost authorities on the subject, the author of Seize the Daylight, Dr. David Perot. Uh, uh, David, I'm really fascinated by this topic topic because it is something that almost everybody I know has an opinion on. A lot of people would like to get rid of it, especially a lot of health experts, but it's much more complicated, I think, than most of us realize. Yes, it is. It, uh, people think about the problems of the change, ch changing the clock, losing an hour's sleep, and that's not pleasant for anybody. And people, some people, it doesn't affect very much. Some people, it affects uh, for several days. Yeah. But you have to remember that the reason we do that is that it makes an effect for the next four months. So if we have, we change the clock now, we will actually affects eight months in the summer and four months in the winter. So the effect of the few days near the change is really a small effect compared to the big effect of having daylight saving time in the summer and standard time in the winter, which I personally think is an excellent plan. The we, we actually tried to drop this uh, before and uh, it didn't last. Talk about that. Well, in 1974, there was a, uh, an a, 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 um, oil embargo, which led to an energy shortage. Right. And Congress put in a two year temporary uh, program of year round daylight saving time. And for most people, it sounded good before it got in. But as soon as we had daylight saving time in the middle of winter, people realized that it was making the winter mornings very dark and very cold. And it became very unpopular very quickly. And so even though it had been put in only as a temporary two-year plan, Congress got rid of the second year of it and uh, got rid of it right after that first year because it was so unpopular. So we have tried it on a nationwide basis, uh, and we have found that nobody liked it. Uh, and Detroit is one of the cities that I think that you believe would be uh, impacted the, the, the hardest. In fact, any city that is at the far western edge of its time zone would kind of uh, see the worst of it, right, if we, if we did but away with it. The more north and the more west, the more problem. And Detroit is at the northwest part of the time zone. And so Detroit would have sunrises in the middle of winter of 9 a.m., uh, Grand Rapids would be 9.15, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan would be 9.30 or later. So many, many people would be getting up in the pitch dark, going to work in the pitch dark, and sending their kids to school in the pitch dark. And that's what became very unpopular when we tried it before. The, uh, we seem to believe that this is really attached to kind of an agricultural calendar uh, decision from many, many years ago. Um, is that fair? And in the end, though, has it actually benefited us beyond the farm? Actually, it's really incorrect, completely incorrect. From Somehow that uh, myth has gotten around. Yes, it has. But the, actual, <laughs> the actuality is that from the very beginning, the main group that was against daylight saving time from 1905, when it was first uh, introduced in England or at least proposed in England, was the farmers. The farmers and the agricultural people, and still today around the world, the farmers are one of the groups against it because they can't follow the clock. In general, they have to follow the sun. And when everyone else follows the clock, it puts them out of sync with everybody else. It's really more popular for the, for the urban people. And it's always been that way. Now, so we again, as I mentioned, we again have a group of senators, and this seems to come up every year where somebody seems to sort of uh, challenge this notion and uh, talk about how antiquated it is, and let's just get some sense, in, uh, sense uh, uh, about it again, common sense back in to just keeping the clocks. Do you think that this push has any better chance than any of the dozens that we've seen before, or when we think it all out for the reasons that you've given us, do we just probably tend to stay with what we have? Well, it's hard for me to judge the politics. That's not really my uh, sure. expertise. But I can tell you this. A lot of the publicity has been about the problems of the first few days, the problems that are caused by people losing sleep, 
and uh, maybe you get some more traffic accidents and things like that because people are sleeping that first few days. Yeah. But you have to consider, first of all, that the, the, what we're talking about is a change that affects eight months in the summer and four months in the winter. So an effect on a few days is not, uh, you know, comparatively very important. Second, uh, losing an hour is no different than going from uh, Chicago to Detroit or from London to Paris or from Beijing to Tokyo. Uh, people have been changing time zones and losing <laughs> an hour all around the world all the time. And somehow they survive it. It's not, it's not a big deal for most people. In fact, when you travel, what you normally do is you, if you think you're going to lose some sleep, you prepare a little. Maybe you go to sleep a little earlier on the day before or the day you're going to travel <laughs> because you know you're going to lose an hour. There you go. And I think the same thing could happen with people uh, for the for the normal daylight saving time. If people just prepared a day or two beforehand and got a little extra sleep, I think it might eliminate many of the problems that we do have on the it's transition funny. We, we, we don't think of jet lag as being for a one-hour time change. It's so right. right. Dr. David Perot, really fascinating stuff. Great to have you on the program. Thanks so much for your time. Happy to be with you, Deb. You bet. Uh, that's going to do it for us. Meet the Press coming up next. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday at 10 a.m. for Flashpoint.